okay you can start uh, very very good morning sir very good morning to all uh, my patient uh, 16 60 years old gentleman he is a resident of udaipur he is a retired government servant he came to complaint sir chief complaint sir pain in the upper abdomen for past 6 weeks assessed with nausea and vomiting hello गोपी सॉरी आई कुड नॉट हियर यू इन दिगनिंग सो मे बी सर आई एम रिस्टार्टिंग माई पेशेंट सिक्सटी इयर्स ओल्ड जेंटलमैन इज रेजिडेंट ऑफ उदयपुर इज रिटायर गवर्नमेंट सर्वन who comes with chief complaints of pain in the upper abdomen for past 6 weeks also with nausea and vomiting is it a pressing illness patient was apparently all right 6 weeks back he developed pain in the upper abdomen for 6 weeks duration which is incidence in onset more in the upper abdomen dull aching in nature present throughout the day it's not radiating to back there is no postural variation aggravated by taking a uh, uh, aggravated by a uh, food intake there is no relieving factors uh associate abdominal pain associate nausea and vomiting approximately 1 to 2 episodes per day which contain a gastric content around 100 to 150 ml it associated with mild epigastric discomfort and no evidence of blood in the vomitus which is aggravated by food intake in large quantity and he uh, had a history of melina is present and history of early satiety history of loss of weight and history of loss of appetite is uh, loss of weight and loss of appetite is present he lost approximately 11 kg in uh, past 6 weeks and history of easy fatigue will be present in the same time also complaints of he is having hot burn and regurgitation and no history of dysphagia no history of slump in the abdomen no history of hematacusia no history of bone pain jaundice cough with hematopsis <laughs> sir uh, sir uh, may i proceed sir yes 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 sir and past history patient has no comorbidity no history of prior surgery and no history of similar complaints in the past personal history patient consumes vegetarian diet he had a normal a bladder appetite sleep pattern disturbed due to the pain and no history of any drug allergy or no history of any substance abuse family history uh, his mother died of ulcerative jaundice curry gallbladder cancer uh, they doesn't know in detail and one of his mother sister diagnosed him with ovarian cancer and his brother diagnosed having leukemia is on medical management and presently they didn't bought any record of his brothers uh, breast treatment detail uh coming to summary my patient 60 years old gentleman present pain in the upper abdomen also with nausea and vomiting with significant loss of weight and appetite also with melina for past 6 weeks and with significant family history of malignancy in his uh, uh in his family and uh, my uh, provisional diagnosis uh, my uh, first provisional diagnosis is uh, gastric cancer okay let's start from the beginning Yes, sir. Uh, so, he present chief complaints of pain abdomen, nausea, and vomiting for past six weeks, sir. Yeah. So here, here, you it, you haven't mentioned the duration of nausea and vomiting. If the duration is same, then you could have said pain upper abdomen associated with nausea and vomiting for six weeks. But here, vomiting is only for two weeks, so you should say pain upper abdomen six weeks, nausea and vomiting for two weeks. So yes, we sir. know that this is the chronological sequence in which symptoms occurred. The presenting yes. complaints should com- consist of or should include the main symptoms and their duration, both. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Now, you said not radiating. You should specifically say where did you ask the radiation to? Uh, so there is uh, pain is not radiating to the back, sir. Yeah, so because in, if a patient has upper mid abdominal pain, you, you should have specified because upper abdomen could be mid, right, or left. You, if if the patient has pointed out, you should say if he has not, then it is all right. 
so if it is upper abdomen it could be gall bladder it could be pancreas it could be spleen it could be anything so radiation is characteristic of pancreatic pain and radiation may be present in biliary pain so if you are thinking of pancreatic pain you should mera echo ho raha hai jiska one hai kya so you should uh, specifically say there is no history of radiation to the back if you are thinking of biliary pain as a possible interpretation you should say there is no history of radiation to the shoulder or to the uh, back of the inferior uh, part of the scapula so uh, at at this level even the negative history and negative examination should be specific not like an mbbs student that there is no aggravating or relieving factor so okay sir and similarly when you say no relieving factors what specifically did you ask that does this relieve the pain what did you ask uh, sir is uh, doing anything to relieve the pain like is consuming a medication or is keeping so you should specifically say if you are thinking of acid dyspeptic pain or pain of uh, uh, reflux esophagitis you should ask whether you took any ppi whether you took any antacids yeah. uh, you should ask whether the food uh, here of course there is a history of aggravation by food but suppose that history is not there whether food relieved the pain whether any change in posture relieved the pain so you should specifically mention that automatically tells me that you know and what you are thinking next okay sir next slide no the previous one now what is the most important thing to be mentioned in the vomitus in a patient where finally you are going to diagnose gastric cancer uh, sir uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, whether it is a projectile vomiting or non projectile vomiting and assess any bilious content or non bilious content that is uh, important yeah so sir. there are few things missing in your presentation you did not describe the nature of uh, vomiting you did not say whether bile is present in the vomitus or not you did not talk of presence of undigested food which was taken maybe uh, 12 hours or even 24 hours ago so the characteristic vomiting of gastric outlet obstruction irrespective of whether it is benign or malignant is large volume projectile vomiting containing non bilious material and may contain undigested food particles food which was taken 12 hours 24 hours even 48 hours ago usually it occurs at the end of the day when the stomach gets full so all these things have to be reflected in your presentation the moment you mention all these words i don't have to ask you anything else and it is obvious that you are talking of gastric outlet obstruction okay okay sir okay. next so early satiety early satiety is a part of the syndrome of gastric outlet obstruction it starts with inability to take normal quantity of food early satiety postprandial fullness nausea and then frank vomiting so it is a spectrum of symptoms so this also should come along with when you describe nausea and vomiting and i'm sure if you go into the details patient will say that i started having early satiety uh oh. a few weeks ago even before oh. actual vomiting occurred okay okay sir how do you describe significant weight loss uh sir uh, more than 10% weight loss over a period of uh 6 uh, month or mm -hmm. more than 5% weight loss in a period of 30 days mm -hmm. check again i think 5 1 one month or 3 months 1 one. One month 1 one month sir. okay so whenever if you are saying that approximately 11 kg that means patient must have weighed himself before and after you should say what was his original weight you should always describe weight loss as so many kg out of so many kg of course 11 kg in 6 weeks irrespective of whatever was the original weight is significant so i am not questioning that but it is good to describe how much okay. was the original weight and how much is the current weight if the patient knows it okay sir why did you ask about heartburn and regurgitation what is its importance uh sir uh, actually the uh, patient himself describes is having a severe heartburn and regurgitation for past 6 weeks uh, so if i am thinking in terms of uh, associated g junction tumor or 
so with this with this history are you thinking of a g junction tumor no sir no sir you are not what no, is sir. the duration of these symptoms heartburn and regurgitation uh, sir he told for uh, it is more in the past two weeks only sir so if it is along with the current illness it could be that uh, when he was having gastric outlet obstruction when he was not vomiting maybe he was having some reflux some regurgitation of the gastric contents into the esophagus and that was causing heartburn and regurgitation if it is long standing then probably the unrelated reflux esophagitis because it is important if you are thinking of g junction tumor say a patient presenting with dysphagia then this history is important it yes, could sir. be that there is long standing gastroesophageal reflux disease reflux esophagitis leading on to barrett's and then adenocarcinoma okay. of the g junction but in a patient with gastric outlet obstruction it has no direct correlation yes sir yes sir but the pradam is telling he is having a significant heartburn and regurgitation so that's why i mentioned yeah that's okay but then you should mention the duration okay sir okay sir. and why is it that you have first mentioned history of melina and then low, much lower down you say no history of hematochezia so gi bleed manifestations all should be mentioned so you should have said no history of melina sorry history of melina but no history of hematemesis and no history of hematochezia the related symptoms should appear together not disjointed okay sir and uh, last line how, wh why did you ask all these symptoms bone pain jaundice cough with hemoptysis uh, sir uh, to no extent of the disease because the patient is old age and with significant loss of weight and appetite i am thinking in terms of malignancy so i asked is having any bone pain or back pain to rule out spinal metastasis and jaundice it may be due to the liver pains or uh, any lesion that compressed in the hdl hepatodural ligament any most compressed in hepatodural ligament that causing a jaundice cough with hemoptysis i have to rule out the uh, pul uh, lung uh, pulmonary metastasis sir which is the commonest site of metastasis if you are thinking of a gastric cancer uh sorry it it will uh, most commonly mess into the peritoneum only sir followed by uh liver then followed by uh lung and uh, bone metastasis sir so why did you mention bone pain as the first bone is the last site of yes sir uh, again I... when you mention uh, more than two items or more than one item they have to be mentioned in some order okay and the safest order to mention is statistical order common things first less common later okay sir and it is a misconception amongst all students that liver metastasis cause jaundice they do not cause jaundice liver metastasis will cause jaundice very rarely if there is a large metastasis located very close to the hilum Hi or the biliary ductal confluence when it is causing compression on a Uh, major biliary channel right. otherwise liver metastasis do not cause jaundice the other situation where there can be jaundice in liver metastasis is when liver is studied both lobes of liver are studied with uh, multiple bilateral, bilateral metastasis, metastasis replacement of parenchyma but these are rare situations so don't mention jaundice as a metastatic history it is wrong okay similarly pulmonary metastasis can cause dry cough by irritating the bronchus but they don't usually cause hemoptysis more common is pleural uh, malignant It's pleural effusion which causes dull diffuse pain in the lower chest and the most important symptom or most common symptom is dyspnea dyspnea on exertion so it is not hemoptysis it is dry cough it is chest pain dull diffuse continuous chest pain and dyspnea on exertion and lastly bone pain and if there is any history of pathological fracture fracture on trivial trauma so these are the common symptoms which you should mention in metastatic history liver metastasis there are no specific symptoms it is just anorexia and weight loss which could be there even without metastasis okay next thanks. what do you mean by similar complaints in the past a patient with cancer will have similar complaints in the past Uh, uh no sir actually uh, even if i am thinking in terms of any benign gastric ulcer in that but you did you did not mention that uh, 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 if you are thinking of gastric ulcer then you should have talked of history of symptoms of acid dyspepsia over a long period of time 
So neither earlier nor here you have mentioned that. Uh, sir, uh, there is uh, no prior, uh, no, there is no prior uh, any history of any acid peptide disease. Or so it has to come out. It has to come out very clearly in your previous slide or here in the past history that there is no history of upper abdominal burning pain aggravated or relieved by food may or may not be associated with hematemesis melina for a long period of time. So that is that you are describing whether patient had symptoms of acid dyspepsia or peptic ulcer disease. And okay. then, yes, you are right, benign gastric, uh, uh, gastric outlet obstruction. So, but uh, I'm asking that because in your differential diagnosis, you did not mention that. So, uh, uh, gastric outlet obstruction because of peptic ulcer can be transient, can be reversible because initially it is caused by inflammatory edema. And that yes. settles either on its own or patient starts uh, uh, or patient reduces the oral intake or patient receives some conservative management and then patient starts eating again. And then uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, obstruction may get relieved. So you should have uh, then uh, considered a possibility of a benign gastric outlet. Because the commonest cause of gastric outlet obstruction is still Peptic ulcer disease. It's not Peptic CA disease. stomach. Yes, sir. Mm. Okay. Mm. Next. So every sentence, every word you mention at this stage at the level of MCH has to be specific, has to be related and has to be self-explanatory. Do you think the, his mother's history has any relationship with his current problems? Any theoretical possibility? Uh, so mother's it at uh, that time they haven't diagnosed it properly sir they doesn't have any reports. suppose i say that it was confirmed cagb could there be a possible relationship between uh, his mother's illness and his problem sir, uh, actually the acceptage on this i am not sure about the gallbladder cancer no no i tell you that it was gallbladder cancer i have the records i treated her she had gallbladder cancer uh, is there any relationship between gallbladder cancer and gastric outlet obstruction? Yes, sir. Uh, gallbladder cancer uh, may can cause uh, gastric outlet obstruction if it is not in the invading the duodenum. So, a tumor then, in the fundus or body of the stomach yes, can infiltrate the duodenum, even neck also, but uh, and it can cause gastric outlet. So, after biliary obstruction, gastroduodenal obstruction is the next common presentation, but Gallbladder cancer presenting with gastric outlet obstruction alone is not a common presentation. So it is possible, although not probable, you will not make a diagnosis of GBC in a patient with gastric outlet obstruction. But you have to remember that the after the two common causes, which are benign gastric outlet obstruction due to peptic ulcer disease and malignant gastric outlet obstruction due to CA stomach, the next two common causes are CA head pancreas and CA gallbladder. Yes, sir. Okay, next. Uh, one of his mother's sister yeah, died okay. of okay. ovarian okay. cancer. Sir. So he has a strong family history of malignancy, mother and uh, his aunt yes. and his brother. Yes, sir. Although brother has a non solid organ malignancy, but uh, still. Next. No, no. Next slide. Yes, sir. Yes. So again, uh, because the duration of nausea and vomiting is different, you have to mention that he has pain abdomen six weeks, nausea and vomiting two weeks, and significant loss of appetite and weight. Yes, sir. And here, instead of directly making a diagnosis, you should say uh, okay, that my... Sorry. Ah, you should not say diagnosis. You should say my interpretation or my uh, analysis is that the patient has gastric outlet obstruction, most likely malignant gastric outlet obstruction. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Uh, general examination. After opening a consent from the patient, patient is conscious, well oriented to the time, place and person, is moderately built and nourished, pallor is present. Uh, he is not ectric, no cyanosis, no clubbing, no pedal edema, no generalized infant 
patient having a raised to be in situ via the nostril patient bmi is 25.7 kg per meter square performance status is one is breath holding time is 30 second hold on hold on for a minute so not related to case presentation but why the p in person is capital you have to be careful see everything you do reflects how much care and attention you give to what you are doing so once you make a presentation always make it a habit to review it after 10 15 minutes and see where things are wrong there are so many other mistakes which i did not point out but you all of you it is see you must remember whatever comments i make it is not directed to the student who is presenting it is for everyone for attending so make sure that uh, these things okay. are not okay. there and why did you look for generalized lymphadenopathy uh sir uh, in this scenario the patient having a gastric cotton obstruction probably malignancy so mm. if i am thinking in terms of any uh, oh. thinking in terms of lymphoma so I, i just want to rule out the lymphoma i'm checking out all the uh, what is more common if you have 60 year old gentleman with gastric outlet obstruction of 2 weeks or 6 weeks duration with significant loss of appetite what is more common uh is malignant gastric cancer that is a uh, which malignant uh, adeno adeno carcinoma so where does adeno carcinoma metastasize to in the neck uh usually it is metastasis in the left supraclavicular nerve so you should have mentioned that first you are right so again students be careful if your differential diagnosis is adeno carcinoma of an abdominal organ or in general surgery breast then you are talking of supraclavicular node and in abdomen left supraclavicular node if your differential diagnosis may include tuberculosis then you are looking at all cervical nodes especially upper deep cervical jugular digastric group of lymph nodes if your differential diagnosis is going to include lymphoma then you are looking at generalized lymphadenopathy cervical axillary inguinal even epitrochlear which are characteristically involved in lymphoma so if you have a young patient where the diagnosis is or the clinical picture is highly su suggestive of malignancy or if the picture is suggestive of malignancy but duration is quite long which is not usual with adeno carcinoma then yes you start thinking lymphoma so i i have no objection if you say generalized but before that you should have mentioned no left oh, supraclavicular definitely. lymphadenopathy and again uh, all of you mentioned cyanosis clubbing but in surgical patient cyanosis and clubbing is less important icterus is important pedal edema is more important so again if you have to mention if you don't mention cyanosis or clubbing at least i don't mind but if you mention it before pedal edema i have an objection pedal edema has to come first that is more important okay sir so all the negative findings also have to be mentioned in order of importance in order of statistics yes vital signs patient is afibril pulse rate is 86 per minute normal in rate and rhythm and respiratory rate is 18 per minute and uh, saturation at true mare is 98 percentage blood pressure is 120 by 70 mm of mercury in the sitting posture measured in the right upper arm so in a patient with gastric outlet obstruction who has been vomiting for 2 weeks who has a rise tube in c2 what other important finding you should have looked for and mentioned in the general physical examination what do you expect this patient to have uh, sir uh, I, uh, general physical examination tone muscle tone is important sir why and uh, uh, because of recurrent vomiting that can lead to hypokalemia so the patient will be fatigue and having a less muscle tone in the meantime the patient because of metabolic alkalosis having hypocalcemia they might having a, a carpopular spasm while checking a blood pressure sir because of hypocalcemia and and uh, uh, because of electrolyte imbalance they may be disoriented and uh, dehydration and disoriented uh, right you are right you are not wrong but something which is much before all this dehydration you didn't mention his hydration skin, status skin turgor yes sir you should have mentioned uh, the tongue you should have mentioned his skin turgor you should have mentioned uh, other things uh, you are right that uh, uh, features of tetany uh, uh, muscle tone they are important but dehydration is very important so you have to 
look for features of dehydration. And you mentioned that he has a rice tube in C2. He doesn't have an IV line. Uh, sir, IV line is also there, sir. If you have mentioned rice tube, you should have mentioned IV line also. That would explain that he is not dehydrated. Maybe he has been hydrated. Okay, so the patient also having a rice tube in C2. IV line and Foley's catheter is in situ, sir. So if there is a Foley's catheter, you should have mentioned how much urine is in the bag and you should have asked the patient or the relatives when was the last uh, bag emptied that will tell you whether he is producing good urine. So all these things are important. You see, in MBBS, when we examine a student, we are only assessing his knowledge, what he knows. At your level, when we are examining you, we want to know that tomorrow if this patient comes to you, how well will you manage this patient? So this is all you will have to look for. Suppose patient gets referred to you from a peripheral doctor, a general surgeon. Once the patient comes to you, you have to make sure patient is well hydrated. All this we will discuss when we discuss the management. So unless you look for them, how would you correct them? Okay. Okay. Sir. And this patient okay. may be a ward round patient. It may not be a long case. So there, all these things are very, very important. Okay, sir. Mm. Yes, sir. Carry on. Examination of the abdomen. Horn inspection. Abdomen is normal in contour. Humblicus is uh, centrally placed and midline. All quadrants are moves equally with respiration. Uh, no scar, no dilated veins, no visible peristalsis. Ernia uh, orifice appears normal. There is no visible cough impulse. External genitalia is normal. And there is uh, no visible lump over the abdomen. Spine is normal. Left supraclavicular and left axilla appears free, uh, normal. So this patient has a rice tube in C2, but suppose he came directly to you without any intervention anywhere. What finding would you expect to see on inspection? Uh, I, uh, on inspection of the abdomen, I first skin target. I want to look about the dehydration. Second thing is patient having a history of gastric water obstruction. So I just want to make sure the visible gastric peristalsis is present or not. And uh, I can... Uh, Make so you would uh, expect, you would expect, or it is possible that there will be fullness in the upper abdomen, fullness. upper central abdomen, and at the left side, and there could be visible gastric peristalsis. So it would be better to say that the uh, abdomen is flat, there is no fullness in the upper abdomen, and there is no visible peristalsis. But in the same breath, add that it is probably because the patient already has a rice tube in C2. So suppose I have missed your rice tube at, when you were presenting the general physical examination. I will not interrupt you. So when you describe uh, 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 no findings, you have to mention them and give a small explanation to that. At this level, at least I as an examiner, I am willing to uh, accept that. So I, if I were you, I would say abdomen is flat. I don't see any fullness or visible peristalsis in the upper abdomen, but that may be because he already has a rice tube in C2 and the stomach has been decompressed. Yes, sir. Because maybe these findings were present before the rice tube was placed. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. On palpation, abdomen is soft, not tender, no uh, palpable lump, no orchonomegaly, no hepatospinomegaly. On percussion, liver uh, span is uh, 13 cm or mid lower low line. No free fluid. Timpanning is uh, free. Uh, 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 there is no free fluid. On parietal examination, tone is normal. No blood staining of vena or no deposit. Uh, what were what were you expecting on the finger stall? You were expecting blood staining. Uh, not blood staining. There, there is a patient at history of melina, so I am just looking for melina is present or not. Any black tar is, uh, So that should have come first. You should have said no melina or the stool is not uh, uh, whether first you have to tell whether. So did you have stool on the fing uh, finger stall? Was it yes, yellow stool or no stool? Sir, yellow stool, sir. So that you should have mentioned because here uh, I don't know whether there was yellow stool or not. If it is yellow stool, then there is no question of saying that there is melina. If you don't have any stool on the finger stall, you can't say that there is no melina. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, respiratory system examination. Bilateral uh, normal acyclovir pestone is present. There is no added or abnormal zones in the bilateral lung field. Cardiovascular system. Uh, I can hear the first and second out zone. There is no murmur or added zone. 
central nervous system there is no focal neurological deficit uh, spine and cranium examination there is no uh, tenderness of the spine there is no palpable lesion over the cranium to so all these other systems mention only if you have examined and you really look for any focal neurological deficit if uh, you haven't done that don't mention it or say okay, sir. i would mm -hmm. like to examine the central nervous system or i would like to get the central nervous system examined by a neurologist or a physician to look for any focal neurological deficit okay sir. so uh, most of the examiners would know whether you have done the examination or not so don't say something which you haven't done if you haven't done a rectal examination say i didn't do a rectal examination because the patient refused or whatever reason but if you don't do something mention what if you had done it what were you looking for so at least i know that you know what this examination is meant for okay sir may i interrupt sir yes yes rajin yeah another thing is in general physical examination you should min, uh, mention about skin changes what are the skin diseases associated with carcinoma stomach uh, uh there is uh, uh i hyperpigmentation no hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis might be present sir and okay what is that called is it pigmented or not pigmented this is it pigmented sir what is that called uh sorry forgot the name sir yeah sudeep kanungo has answered <laughs> acanthosis nigricans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is usually mm -hmm. seen in the axilla and groin in diabetic mm -hmm. patients but all other areas if it is involved then you should think of acanthosis nigricans of malignancy if it is just in the axilla or in the groin then you should check whether the patient is diabetic and if he is diabetic you can say it's due to diabetes and not due to cancer also the duration is it may proceed by many many months and when you are suspecting gastric outlet obstruction you can't rule out other tumors in the area which cause gastric outlet obstruction like carcinoma gallbladder carcinoma pancreas carcinoma uh, duodenum all these can cause gastric outlet obstruction not gastric carcinoma so you have to give us a differential diagnosis so you see it would be better to say gastric outlet obstruction possibly malignant because as dr desai pointed out even ca duodenum although it is less common than ca stomach depending on its location if it is in the first or second part of duodenum proximal to the papilla it will cause bilious uh, non bilious vomiting exactly like gastric outlet obstruction of uh, ca stomach on the other hand if it is d2 beyond the papilla or d3 again it is called gastric outlet obstruction but it is associated with bilious vomiting so a tumor of the uncinate process may not cause jaundice but can cause gastric outlet obstruction but that vomiting will be bilious bilious on the other hand ca head pancreas causing gastric outlet obstruction but no jaundice is unusual uncommon so if you see gastric outlet obstruction but there is no jaundice and say ultrasound or ct shows a mass in relation to head of pancreas then most probably it is uncinate process okay sir yes carry on Uh, summary: Six uh, years old gentleman, personal pain in the upper abdomen for past six weeks, also with nausea and vomiting for past two weeks, with significant loss of weight and appetite, also with malaria, and he had a significant family history of malignancy in his family with unremarkable abdominal finding. And uh, my uh, it, it is the correct term is no remarkable abdominal finding or unremarkable abdomen, but here you should add. Is there rice tube in C two? Okay, Because sir. maybe rice tube has taken care of some findings like visible gastric peristalsis or a dilated okay. stomach, which could have okay. been seen, which could have been percussed. And on the other hand, if you decompress the stomach, one finding may become more prominent. What is that finding, which you may not have been able to look for when the stomach was distended? If there is a lump in the 
pre pyloric or pyloric area okay so when you have a distended stomach you may not be able to feel it but once you decompress so you should always examine the patient after adequate decompression of the stomach and if you do that sometimes you may be able to feel a lump which was not there earlier okay and yeah. can i interrupt again yes yes please what is your interpretation if a rice cube has been poured what are the reasons why you prepare the stomach that way one is to relieve vomiting but what are the other causes and reasons uh, uh sir first uh, putting a, a rice soup to decompress the stomach sir because having a why 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 do you Suppose want to decompress the stomach you can suction it out on the operation table but you don't do that you you give a two weeks uh, decompression with the nasogastric tube why and uh, if we want to prepare the patient for further anesthesia like upper jaw endoscopy we can mm -hmm. give a lavaser to the so why do you want to do that as dr desai said endoscope has a suction channel when you put the endoscope you can suck it out uh, sir uh, 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 we need a proper lavaser prior to upper jaw endoscopy to visualize the anti stomach and uh, anti uh, gastric mucosa sir you are right but is that you are right but is that the primary reason What is primary. the surgical reason? Uh, surgical reason, yes, sir. And we can uh, rule out the aspiration of the content. Whether there is uh, any active bleeding is present or not, we can make out by keeping a rice tube. And in the okay, meantime, okay, I'll put the question in a different stomach. way. What happens to the normal stomach in gastric outlet obstruction? Uh, so because of the extensive distension, it will lose its tonicity, sir. To Loss of tonicity of yeah, and what about the gastric wall? The gastric wall will be edematous. Ah, precisely. So all this you want to reduce before you attempt any surgery on the stomach, because yes, if it's edematous and you put your sutures, the signs of leakage, the chances of uh, uh, repeat gastric outlet obstruction at a different time once the edema uh, subsides are higher. so there are multiple reasons why you place a rice tube in a patient with gastric outlet obstruction primary of course is that it takes care of the vomiting second is in, uh, inevitably or almost all cases uh, these patients will require an upper gi endoscopy if you put the scope in a patient who has a distended stomach with lot of solid food material the moment the scope goes through the ge junction there will be reflux of the material and the patient can aspirate so you don't and same holds true in a patient with achalasia you should not straight away take the patient with achalasia to endoscopy because this patient can aspirate and die on the endoscopy table so the esophagus also needs the same preparation uh, by placing a naso esophageal tube and decompressing the esophagus then as dr desai said this distended chronically obstructed distended stomach is atonic it is edematous so you want to take care of that edema so that your sutures hold and atonic because then even if you do a drainage or you do a resection and uh, do a gastro jejunal or gastro duodenal anastomosis the stomach will take time to recover its function whereas decompression helps it like a distended urinary bladder when you place the foley catheter so all these are the reasons why you place the rice tube but the most important reason is to prevent aspiration during endoscopy and you rightly said a full stomach is difficult to evaluate whereas an empty stomach clean stomach is easier to evaluate but that is the secondary reason and somebody asked the duration i think it is usually about uh, 24 48 maximum 72 hours uh, the best is that when the returns become clear so you put saline and saline comes out you know that the stomach has been cleared yes carry on uh, okay sir at this stage my uh, professional diagnosis is gastric outlet obstruction due to malignant gastric lesion why is this not benign uh first the patient is old as a more than 60 years with a uh, hond of month history of all the symptoms with significant loss of weight and appetite and he is having a strong uh, 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 family history of cancer so all these Uh, uh uh history and uh, finding of suggestive of most probably uh, malignant gastric lesions sir 
and no past history to suggest acid dyspeptic uh, acid disorder although it is not that all patients who present with benign gastric outlet obstruction will have history of acid dyspepsia but less likely so if there is no previous history to suggest peptic ulcer disease uh, elderly patient short duration significant weight loss uh, a reasonably strong family history of malignancy all these things yes you should mention you can mention as uh, the diagnosis is malignant gastric outlet obstruction and then comes the organ or the site of malignancy so again statistically speaking ca stomach which is usually in the prepyloric uh, region uh, then ca duodenum first and uh, proximal second part uh, unlikely to be ca head pancreas because there is no jaundice unlikely to be ca uncinate process because which can be without jaundice because the vomitus uh, you did not mention but i presume it is non bilious and a rare uh, cause could be a uh, fundus or body gallbladder malignancy which is infiltrating the duodenum okay sir mm-hmm. next uh, sir uh, uh, i would like to uh, 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 admit the patient I, i would like to do the uh, innocent to confirm diagnosis so the first aim in a suppose he comes to you de novo with this history your first aim is to confirm the diagnosis no sir i will admit the patient i will resuscitate i will stabilize the patient then my first uh, stabilize resuscitation from what his hemodynamics you said uh, were vitals were normal what stabilization uh, sir ac- actually that patient already admitted as stabilizer so if the patient comes with this history if the patient's dehydration or electrolyte so imbalance you have, have to understand first. you have to understand the difference in meaning of the words resuscitation stabilization and optimization these patients are likely to have dehydration and metabolic derangement unless the dehydration is severe enough to cause hypotension then yes resuscitation and stabilization is resuscitation is of a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. unstable here he is likely to be fluid and electrolyte wise unstable so that is what is called resuscitation or optimization so the first aim of treat of management of a patient with gastric outlet obstruction is correction of fluid and electrolyte and metabolic imbalance so your first investigations will not be to for diagnosis the first investigation is to find out what is his uh, electrolyte profile and what is his abg profile that will be the first investigation to do yes sir so do we have that before the resuscitation or uh, correction uh, was done sir on 22nd i did a basic blood profile basic But, blood profile so uh, what what would you expect suppose he came to you without any treatment what what did you expect to see in the investigations uh hypokalemia uh hypochloremia and abg features of metabolic alkalosis findings sir because of gastric outlet obstruction anything in the hemogram uh hemo is hemogram uh, it because of dehydration might be constated and uh, you need to check with them yeah, so you should test. always start from hemogram then you should go to renal functions you expect his urea to be high creatinine may be high and then there will be electrolyte imbalance so imbalance. whenever again you mention things you should mention in sequence and sequences hemogram renal function here lft is not important so hemogram renal functions and electrolytes and then abg okay okay so we will what skip if you have megaloblastic anemia what would be the impression that you would develop if this patient had megaloblastic anemia uh, in addition to all these features i will think in terms of uh, pernicious anemia pernicious anemia yeah. that so have you ruled out pernicious anemia as an associated cause for ca stomach nowhere in the history you mentioned any of the features of b complex vitamin deficiency uh uh, sir, uh the patient uh, sensoring is normal sir so what are uh, the lesions you can get in uh, pernicious anemia other than carcinoma of the stomach achlorhydria will be there achlorhydria will be there yeah and, uh, because of that what do you tell her megaloblastic anemia will be there and uh, uh features uh, it can be related to vitamin b12 deficiency yeah neurological dysfunction and weakness glossy tongue kilosis 
all these yes, with supported yes. diagnosis of megaloblastic anemia these are other vitamin b vitamins which cause this like b1 and uh, b6 but they go hand in hand with b12 deficiency in pernicious anemia okay. so since dr desai was asking you about systemic manifestations of malignancy and especially ca stomach another common thing which it would be good it will earn you some brownie points if you mention that there is no evidence of deep vein thrombosis in fact ca stomach ca pancreas uh, they are yes, uh, associated with uh, deep vein thrombosis right. and as he mentioned the deep vein thrombosis may come first and ca stomach may be detected later or ca pancreas may be detected later okay i think we will skip this because this is more theoretical the, but all of you should know because this is again a favorite question in the theory exam the metabolic and electrolyte imbalances in uh, gastric outlet obstruction and how to correct them so all of you must know that okay sir yes. in, um, in blood parameters the plated is 1.5 lakh which is just above the uh, normal and potassium is on hyperkalemia side sir 5.5 ml per liter and blood urea and creatinine is normal sir and okay so how will you now uh, the patient has already been optimized all the disturbances have been corrected how will you confirm the diagnosis uh, so to confirm my diagnosis i uh, i want to do the upper gi endoscopy sir let's see so we have already discussed that upper gi cannot be done straight away it has to be after proper preparation of the patient and of the stomach both yes sir hmm. yes sir and uh, upper gi endoscopy sir uh, uh, is it vegas There is an incursal bed more than five millimeter involving more than seventy percent circumference. Suggest for this bed it is grade D on Los Angeles classification. And uh, the anthem is edematous, infiltrate, and thickened mucosa with deformed pylorus. They took a biopsy. They enter the duodenum. Duodenum is edematous, infiltrate, thickened mucosa. D one D two junction is narrowing. Scope cannot be negotiated. Impression is gastric outlet obstruction. Corey nature, Corey malignant, and uh, they took a biopsy. In the meantime, the patient was having a esophagitis. So, if you were the endoscopist and you saw these findings, what will be your assessment? Uh, sir, uh, in the in the you don't know the, the history. You don't know the history. You are just doing endoscopy. If these yes, are the findings, what will be your assessment? Uh, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, I will check one more thing, sir. Whether the stomach uh, distendability with insufflation, if it is present or not, I will check. In how does meantime, that? How does that help you? Uh, if it is distensible, if it is not distensible. Uh, so here, uh, the mucosa only the mucosa is edematous. uh but if the stomach is not distensible i will think in terms of uh, uh linitis plastica but uh, the fundus fundus and body they said is normal it is yes, in sir. fact they are saying full of food so which means that probably it is distended the lesion is or the pathology is confined to antrum and d1 d2 or uh, d1 only up to d1 d2 junction So you are What right. What is the significance of? Excuse me, can I interrupt, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah. What is the significance of duodenal involvement in tumors of the distal stomach? In which condition it will be involved, and in which condition it is unlikely to be involved? Uh, sir, uh, patient who already had a uh, expulsory associated gastritis, there may be a Metaplasia develop both in the stomach and in the duodenum, sir. Is that the reason, or is it something else? Uh, uh something else, sir. I, so between the I'm two malignancies, sure. Doctor Desai asked you that in which malignancy duodenum is likely to be involved, in which it is less likely to be involved. There are two Basically malignancies. Basically, pushing you towards lymphoma or lymphoma. Carcinoma. See, adenocarcinoma generally does not extend into the duodenum. Duodenum. It stops yes, at the pylorus. Yes, sir. Whereas, 
if there is a continuous involvement of both the uh, uh, antrum and duodenum, it is more likely to be lymphoma. And you were right when you said that distensibility. So distensibility will not be there if it is lineitis. But here, fundus and body are normal. So even if it is lineitis, it is probably localized lineitis. And the second possibility where the uh, wall is thickened, uh, non-distensible, is a lymphoma. Yes, and the other point here in favor of lymphoma is that both stomach and duodenum are involved. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. But based, as I said, if you don't know the age or if you don't know the history of patient, you only look at endoscopy findings. These findings can be there in benign uh, gastric outlet obstruction also, thickened yes, edematous. Yes, benign because there are no nodules, there are no, there is no growth described. So it is very difficult to say what it is. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, uh, they took a biopsy, sir. The yes. biopsy took on outside. We have a biopsy report, sir. Mm. What does it show? Uh, biopsy, which is successive or suspected low grade lymphoproliferative disorder. Suppose the biopsy was negative, inconclusive, no malignancy, no granuloma. Yes, sir. In that scenario, uh, I would like to do the Endoscopic ultrasound. No, no. What will be your what will be your interpretation before you do something? What will you think? You saw this endoscopy picture. Perhaps is negative. What comes to your mind? So, since uh, we are already at ten, if you have a young patient, as I said, strong history of malignancy, any imaging shows diffuse thickening of the viscous, whether it is stomach, small bowel, large bowel. And if you see something, especially edema and thickening and biopsies are negative, immediately lymphoma should come to your mind. The second possibility yes, which should come to your mind is tuberculosis. Yes, okay. So, yes, and in that situation, you attempt to do a deeper biopsy. How do you do a deeper biopsy? Uh, sir, uh, either we can do with uh, endoscopy or we use uh, under the guidance of UF. We can go ahead with a well biopsy, sir. You have to take many of So, well biopsy is endoscopy. Well biopsy means that you take a biopsy at one place. At the same place, you take another biopsy. Then you take another biopsy. So, you are trying to go from the mucosa into the submucosa. Because sub both of these uh, lymphoma and tuberculosis will be submucosal lesions. So, that is what is called a well biopsy or a biopsy on biopsy. The other is, uh, I think, uh, check with your endoscopy colleagues. There are larger biopsy forceps now available. So they give you a, a bigger chunk and that is how you get deeper. And third is a fine needle aspiration cytology because when you do an US guided FNAC or a needle biopsy, a core biopsy, you puncture the mucosa and you get into the wall of the stomach. So these are the ways that you can get a, a tissue diagnosis in a uh, patient where bi first biopsy is negative. So the moment you get a negative biopsy and you see diffuse thickening of the wall of the viscous, lymphoma should come to your mind. Okay. Uh, so I think the, we need... Yeah, Rajin. The, uh, the same patient also underwent uh, endoscopy in our hospital, sir. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an endoscopic picture and endoscopic finding. Endoscopic yeah. finding, uh, thickened ample pole, very suggestive of lymphoma, sir. Yeah. Actually, yeah. they also took the biopsy in our hospital. Yes. And the biopsy which is suggest for mildly inflamed gastric mucosa. No evidence yeah. of any ground. So two, two biopsies being negative, definite gastric outlet obstruction, you are seeing edematous thick mucosa uh, is very strongly suggestive of a lymphoma. I think we will close here. So, uh, sir, students, uh, the patient underwent a PET CT outside, sir. We will yes, see the yes. claim only, sir. What did it show? Uh, uh, just, just tell us the report. Uh, just send it, uh, PET CT, head and neck region. The right lobe of thyroid, there is a hypotensive lesion of 1.5 cross 1.2 centimeters, suggested UC correlation. In the chest, multiple FDG are bilateral upper and lower paratracheal subterranean and bilateral node, suggested of In the stomach, low grade FDG are with endogenous enhancing symmetric thickening, maximum 
as you of 3.2 in the net involving about 9 to 10 cm maximum wall thickness about 2.5 cm yeah again again this suggests a possibility of a lymphoma uh, milton asked that is it necessary to mention negative b symptoms you see if 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 based on your history and examination you thought of lymphoma then yes otherwise if you mention then i will know that you know the final diagnosis so in a 60 year old gentleman who is presenting with features of gastric outlet obstruction significant weight loss clinical diagnosis will still be cs stomach i don't think that that would change so i i am i'm not sure whether i would mention the negative now you can go back and ask that is different okay sir so i think we will close students please send me a mail bkkapoor.india@gmail.com write stomach in the topic of the mail i will send you the chapter on uh, stomach so we'll close thank you rajin thank you thank you Thank, thank you, you sir. sir. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Thank you.